The Age of Baroque. In this PowerPoint, we will look at the characteristics and features of Baroque as a pervasive and powerful movement in both painting, um, music, and architecture in 17th century Europe. But before we get to Baroque, we're going to take a quick look at Mannerist art, which really spanned the end, uh, end of the Renaissance time period. Manor Before I begin, please take a look at your homework and what you need to do um, after listening to these notes. Mannerism was a rather small school of art in the late 16th and early 17th century, but it made a big impact. Mannerism is kind of the anti-Italian Renaissance art. It is characterized by its lack of proportion, its disproportionate focus of, on the human beings, and its kind of weirdness and the way things in it don't make sense. Mannerism uh, was reflective of the troubled times of the 16th century that we talked about in the last unit, the social and economic upheaval that went along with the Protestant Reformation, the economic changes brought about by exploration, the violence, the wars of religion, and the witch trials, etc. So let's look at a few Mannerist paintings. Parmigiano, an Italian Mannerist. This is his Madonna with the long neck. Now, there's a very frequently religious subject matter in Mannerist paintings, but I love this painting as an example of Mannerism. It is absolutely bizarre. Um, one of the easiest ways to recognize Mannerist paintings is the utter lack of proportion in there, whereas our Renaissance painters tried to create everything symmetrically, and in proportion to real life, the Mannerists abandoned that. And so look at this enormous woman who is uh, Mary, this enormous portrayal of the Virgin Mother with her long neck. Look at her long finger. She is absolutely huge. Look at the long leg over here on the left that belongs to one of these children or cherubs, the absolute length and disproportionate qualities of the child Jesus she holds in her arms. And just kind of this weird quality to the painting as well. What is this column about? I have no idea. That's kind of a weird thing there in the painting. And then finally, look at this little man down here. Is he a man or a statue? Now these are just kind of some of the odd features of a Mannerist painting and you can see in it the lack of a proportion. Perhaps the best known Mannerist painter was called El Greco. El Greco means the Greek. It's Spanish for the Greek. I forget El Greco's real name. He had one but let's not worry about that right now. El Greco came from Greece, but he lived and he worked the uh, majority of his life in Spain. And actually, I heard on the radio a couple of months ago that Spain and Greece are having a fine fight right now over uh, laying claim to El Greco and his work. Uh, this is perhaps his best known painting, Lea Kuhn, which is a mythological portrayal of the uh, misfortunes that befall a village. And you can see the snake. So this is kind of a gruesome painting. Um, you can see the suffering of the people in it, the men who are trying to beat back the snakes but are succumbing to them. And very often Mannerist paintings will have a sense of discomfort or pain within them. The uh, disproportionate figures, the horse here in the middle of the painting, uh, many of you all might have studied this painting, Lea Kuhn, in your Spanish class. It's very often uh, used uh, in discussions of Spanish culture. This is another of El Greco's painting, the Pieta. I chose this one to put in the PowerPoint because we have studied Michelangelo's Pieta and looked at some of those more classical ones. So again, you can see the distress on the Blessed Mother's face, uh, the lack of proportion. Her head is too small, her body too wide, Christ's torso too big. 
etc. But the painting gives a fine uh, emotional sense. It still presents a fine emotional sense of what the moment, the pieta, the suffering, the pity is about. Antwerp is a city in the Dutch Republic, and Antwerp had its own school of mannerism. I want to compare this to Northern Renaissance art, which uh, we have already looked at and was notable for its fine use of detail. Look at the great detail in this painting, The Adoration of the Magi by Jan Gosseret. A story we all know, you've seen in a lot of these, the emphasis on religious subject matter is very common for the Renaissance time period and the Baroque time period, as we shall see. But, and even the fine use of proportion, and look at all the details. What really strikes me about this painting is that this looks so war-torn, um, like it's ruins, like it's... Uh, been subject to bombs almost in a manner of destruction. There's the little dogs in the front. There's the ripped up tile and the bricks, uh, the angels watching over the magi, etc. So while it's a very commonly known and commonly used theme in art, it's presented in kind of a distorted and distracted way. Baroque, as we have discussed in looking at Baroque architecture, um, was much more significant than mannerism. Baroque was everything and everywhere in the 17th century in Europe. And we're going to look at some paintings, and you might not see this so much here, but Baroque is deeply representative of the rise of absolutism in Europe is deeply associated with power and with grandness and with wealth. Baroque is very is very much also closely associated with um, the resurgence of Catholicism in the Catholic Reformation, where the Protestants chose to, to simplify and to strip down. The Catholics went in the other direction very often through the uh, expression of Baroque, and they built big and they built opulent and extravagant churches with beautiful stained glass windows and lovely statues and all kinds of fine art and beautiful, strong music. So much great religious music was uh, composed during the 17th century, during the Baroque period. Think about Handel's Messiah, the Alleluia chorus of that, or the work of Johann Sebastian Bach. Very often these were deeply, uh, deeply religious. And so Baroque is at one time, it is, it is symbolic of the rise, it is reflective of the rise of these powerful absolute monarchs and is also very closely associated with a resurgent Catholic church, with the Catholic Reformation. Um, as we discussed before when we looked at the architecture, Baroque is dramatic, Baroque is big, Baroque is beautiful, and it is deeply deeply religious. It is can it can be quite extravagant in the case of architecture. It can be sort of uh, gaudy or or over the top. And in painting, which we're going to look at here, I think Baroque is often very religious and very, very dramatic. And very often in Baroque painting, you will see the contrast between light and dark, especially in a Caravaggio, which we see here. And we'll look at a few of his paintings, a very early Baroque painter who uses the contrast of the light and the dark to make his paintings dramatic. Something to keep in mind about Baroque painting too, you are not going to get this effect looking at this PowerPoint on your computer screen, but Baroque paintings were painted on huge canvases, big enormous canvases um, that would have stood as tall as a wall that would have been as big as a person and you have to keep that in mind and kind of assessing the drama of a piece of Baroque painting, that these are not small, tiny, uh, little canvases, but very, very large ones. And this is actually my favorite Caravaggio painting, The Calling of St. Matthew. You can see the sort of Renaissance era, 17th century era, era, era excuse me, um, characters in this, and a very dramatic use of light and dark. Matthew was a sinner, he was a tax collector. But here he is being called 
by Christ. And you can see him pointing at himself. Who? Me? You can't mean me. And the hand of Christ reaching out to him. If you look very carefully, you'll be able to see his head and body over here. The entombment of Christ, again, the religious subject matter, the very strong emotional depiction of the religious subject matter, the use of light in the dark. Notice, too, the hands and the expressiveness of the hands. Caravaggio often, often has very meaningful and expressive hands in his painting. They convey the sense of emotion and drama. Um, Caravaggio did a fine job in this painting with human proportion and realism. And uh, the, the light of Christ on the body of Christ and the, just the drama and, and sense of, uh, of drama and emotion and pain in this painting. The Supper at Emmaus, the well-known story of the two men who talk with Christ and they know him in the breaking of the bread. And so here they are. And again, there's the hands, the guy on the right, he's got his arms stretched out. We've just recognized Christ, the man in the green shirt on the left. He's about to jump out of his chair, literally. And so this painting again through light and dark, it really conveys a fine sense of drama and emotion. And again, remember this being a very big canvas, not a little computer screen or something like that to kind of help you get, just kind of imagine the drama of these paintings. Peter Rubens was a French painter, and he is very much associated with the Baroque school as well. Very different from Caravaggio. Rubens also paints on great big canvases. Um, he also paints a lot of very religious, uh, subject matter, religiously themed work. This one is not. This is to commemorate. This painting was to commemorate the arrival of Marie de Medici at Marseille. She had come, of course, to marry one of the French kings. And so the glorification of the state, the absolutists, okay, look at uh, how powerful and everything this is. Look at all the detail in this work. Rubens' work, the drama is in the people and it's in the busyness it's in the way that he has painted all of these things and again this would be on a very large canvas the arrival of Maria de Medici I love the gilding on the small ship that she has arrived on the water nymphs who have come to greet the queen uh, there's a cherub up here blowing the trumpets in front of her and these very richly very finely dressed people uh, the red velvet, all these signs of, of wealth and power and importance. This is a detail of the arrival of Marie de Medici, again, of the water nymphs. You will see a lot of these kind of human depictions in a Rubens work. And here, of course, is Marie herself. You can pick her out in the big painting. Um, but she's really kind of a fine detail in there. Uh, the, the main painting is not so much centered on her, but look at the richness of her clothing. I think she kind of has a deer in the headlights look on her face, but the richness of her clothing, the, the soldier over here who is bowing down before her, this guy, I have to admit, y'all, he kind of cracks me up. I, I don't know what that is about. But again, just a sense of wealth and power and how everyone is in awe of her as she arrives in France to become the queen. This is a very dramatic painting and is actually kind of hard to look at. Imagine this, uh, his massacre of the innocents, again, going back to the biblical story of King Herod, who orders the massacre of the children, of the boy children aged two and under in an attempt to, um, in an attempt to kill the Messiah, to kill this new king who has come. But again, look at these bodies. Look at these strong men who are doing all these awful things to these children. I mean, look at this one up here. Look at the mother who is nursing at the breast and, and is going to be stabbed. We have the small children down here, the woman over here who is crying and trying to protect the child. Like, this is a very dramatic, very emotional painting. 
and a very popular one of Rubens and very, very uh, Baroque, just in its dramatic portrayal of this story. I would not want to hang this painting in my living room. You don't want to look at this, but just the drama and the violence, he conveys all of this so well and kind of jumps off the canvas at you. Rembrandt is a wonderful painter, and in a couple of days in class, we'll look at a school of art called Dutch Realism, and Rembrandt is very much a crossover artist. We can consider him a Dutch realist or uh, a Baroque painter, and this is perhaps his best known painting, and this one is certainly a Baroque painting, The Night Watch. This is commissioned by a town in the Dutch Republic, and uh, he's kind of commemorating their, their magistrates, their leaders in it. They're keeping the people safe. They are on watch at night. Um, this is a very busy painting. There are lots of people in it. There are lots of things that are going on. And um, this painting is on an enormous canvas. It is uh, 12 feet high by 12 feet wide. So you can imagine it would about, it would about fill a room. It's on an absolutely enormous canvas. And what's truly remarkable about this painting is, is what Rembrandt is best known for, which is his light, the amazing way he could paint light, Rembrandt's light, and especially this kind of uh, ephemeral looking little girl here in the middle. What has really amazed um, uh, historians and artists and others about this painting is what's the source of light on, on this child and what is she there to represent? But these are the men of the city who are gathering the night watch, who are going to keep the place safe. We have the drums over here. We have the two men here in, in the middle and many others along in the way. But a beautiful, very dramatic uh, painting by Rembrandt and an excellent example of his use of light. This is a painting you have probably seen before, Christ in the storm on the Sea of Galilee. When Christ is asleep in the ship, in the boat, and the disciples are panicking for fear of their lives, and they awaken Christ, and they're like, hey, are you going to help us out? And he calms the seas. And this painting, again, a beautiful use of Rembrandt's light. The original is on an enormous canvas, very emotional, very dramatic, the sense of danger to all on the ship is really present there. But to know this is a ship of Galilee, of course, the message of the painting that Christ will calm, will calm the waves, dangerous as they are, but a beautiful, very Baroque painting. Bernini, uh, his sculpture, The Ecstasy of St. Teresa of Avila, who was a mystic and would have these communions with Christ uh, or they would they would she would be able to talk to Christ directly and the angel is going to pierce her in the heart with the arrow just the drama the look on her face the ecstasy of Saint Teresa of Avila the drama of the angel um, the light of the Lord shining down and all the gilded um, uh, poles that's a terrible word, uh, but, but the, all the gilding coming down to emulate the light of the Lord behind her. This is at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Very beautiful, very beautiful sculpture. Uh, just to give you a look at a couple of more examples of um, Baroque architecture, of course, the Palace of Louis XIV of Versailles is the granddaddy of them all, the greatest example of Baroque architecture. But it is a style that all the absolute monarchs um, built in in the 17th century. The Residence, the Palace of the Habsburgs um, that was constructed in the 17th century in the Baroque style, not as enormous at Versailles, but still has a very, very strong um, effect, the magnification, the, the symbolization of, of power and of the wealth of the king. This is a photograph of a Catholic church in Vienna built by the Habsburg Emperor Charles VI, the Karlskirch. I'm sure I butchered that word, but Kirsch is the German word for church. And you can see here the very large church with the dome um, and the columns, very opulent. It is incredibly extravagant on the inside. Uh, Catholics in the 17th century strongly embraced Baroque as a way to separate themselves from the Protestants who uh, who were simplifying and so they built these huge churches 
dresses, again, that were, that were extravagant, that were beautiful, um, that were opulent, that to the Catholic mindset gave glory to God, that uh, glorified the saints, etc. And so it's a photograph of the inside of this. Many churches were built in this era in um, this kind of with this kind of dramatic form and look at the altar and the artwork around the altar and this emphasis on drama and on beauty and on the magnificence and power of god uh, many many fine examples of this across europe at the time not as big and not as dark as the gothic cathedrals of the middle ages but certainly enormous and incredibly beautiful in their own time period. So many fine examples of uh, beautiful, beautiful Baroque music. I would encourage you to look some up and listen to it. Uh, deeply religious, very powerful, etc. Too well known to the best known perhaps um, Baroque composers were George Friedrich Kandel, German, and Johann Sebastian Bach, also German, both Catholic um, composers of the time who wrote beautiful music of all kinds. And in fact, I will leave you with a few seconds of Handel's Hornpipe Overture and from his um, larger work, the Overture for the Royal Fireworks. So this isn't religious music, but it's beautiful, beautiful all the same. And I hope this works. And maybe it's not going to work in this. So hopefully on your video, you will be able to, um, uh, to play that little soundbite. Beautiful, beautiful music. 